Hey guys, hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video, we are going to take on uh, pediatrics and uh, we are going to take on the infectious disease portion of pediatrics for USMLE Step 2 CK. So, peds and infectious diseases we are starting in this video and uh, I hope that uh, when you watch this video, you know, in the uh, days of your exams or whatever you have, you feel confident enough to going uh, to the exam. So, the first topic I will be covering is the otitis media. Now, you know for the USMLE Step 2 CK, you should know what are the causative organisms for otitis media. Now, what is the presentation of otitis media? Now, what are the risk factors for otitis media and how do you treat the otitis media? So, these four points you should know for your Step 2 CK. Now, causative organism if we talk about the causative organisms for otitis media you know the most common organism is strep pneumo this is followed by haemophilus influenzae and the third is murexella catarrhalis now in this in this video i'll be covering uh, the most common organism for acute bacterial rhinosinusitis you know murex uh, you know haemophilus influenzae is the most common strep pneumo is the second and murexella catarrhalis is the third most common organism when it comes to acute bacterial rhinosinusitis but in case of uh, otitis media the most common organism is the strep pneumo now <clears throat> Let's talk about what is the presentation of otitis media. See guys, otitis media is nothing but it is the inflammation of the middle ear. So you will get uh, what are the features of inflammation that you will get the fever and uh, you will get uh, uh, the uh, changes in the middle ear. Now what are the changes in the middle ear and these are the pathognomic sign or I would say the most important sign that uh, allow you you know to diagnose that it is a case of otitis media. So you will see the tympanic membrane being red okay this is very very important and you will see the tympanic membrane being bulging. So if you see the tympanic membrane is red if you see the tympanic membrane is bulging and if you see that there is fever then you can diagnose that it is a case of otitis media in the step 2 CK we are asked about the risk factor now the most common risk factor is age obviously otitis media is not seen in adult children it is seen in oh oh my god sorry not adult children I would say you know children above the age of like 10 15 years you don't see otitis media otitis media is seen in you know kids like 6 to 18th 18 months of age this is the most common age group in which you see the otitis media now lack of breastfeeding so if an infant is not breastfed adequately then otitis media risk increases if there is a if there is a smoker in the house like if the parents they smoke then you know the risk of otitis media increases and obviously if there is viral upper respiratory tract infection let's say there is some pharyngitis stuff going on then the risk for otitis media it also increases now the treatment for otitis media is obviously a penicillin so you can give amoxicillin you can give you know stuff like that uh, to cover these organisms and uh, what is the catch over here they say if the otitis media is occurring again within an interval of 30 days this is very very important if it is occurring within an interval of 30 days or let's say you know four weeks less less than equal like if if it is occurring in an interval of four weeks then we need need to add amoxicillin and clavulinate in the uh, you know recurrent infection because what what is the theory that uh, you have given amoxicillin in the previous infection and there might be some resistance against the amoxicillin so that is why you are adding clavulinate so this is the catch over here so these are all the points that you should know about otitis media when it comes to the exam you, you should know causative organism you should know the presentation you should know the risk factor and you should should know the treatment for otitis media now the next point is about the rheumatic fever like a little bit uh, idea about the rheumatic fever which is important in the exam and that is uh, about you know penicillin so see guys penicillin is used for treating the uh, strep throat or the strep pharyngitis and penicillin is also important for prophylaxis in case of uh, rheumatic uh, you know prophylaxis against the rheumatic heart disease i would say or you know prophylaxis against the rheumatic fever or prophylaxis in 
in the rheumatic fever what you ever want to say uh, penicillin is important for treatment and also for prophylaxis so this is again second concept the third concept is about the lymphadenopathy see guys lymphadenopathy is asked in the step 2 examination and what i want to say over here is lymphadenopathy can be unilateral lymphadenopathy it can be bilateral lymphadenopathy now if it is unilateral lymphadenopathy the most common organism which is responsible for the lymphadenopathy is the streptococcus or the staph aureus so obviously the antibiotic that you are going to uh, give to this patient should be the one which covers strep as well as staph now the most common organism is this the next important point in this aspect is if the person has dental abscess or if the person has dental caries then what would be the most common organism that is causing the lymphadenopathy so in that case the most common organism that causes the lymphadenopathy is uh, you know the oral anaerobes and uh, uh, privotella or uh, uh, you know uh, privotella is the most common organism in that case and uh, so privo Privo, uh, privotella sorry for the spelling if you know i i don't know whether it is privotella or provitella but you know you know oral anaerobes privotella bacterioides these are the most common organism if there is a dental caries or if there is dental abscess now you know if there is uh, exposure to the uh, rabbits then uh, you know it is uh, uh, something which is called as francisella so that that may also be asked francisella if there is exposure to rabbit if there is exposure to cat then you know that there is bartonella and you know that in case of bartonella there will be a papule at the site where the cat has scratched and there will be tender lymphadenopathy close to that point mycobacterium tuberculosis may also you know cause uh, lymphadenopathy and that is painless lymphadenopathy this is the classical question that is asked in step 2 ck if there is bilateral lymphadenopathy then you know it is probably viral now what what viruses can cause you know bilateral lymphadenopathy and how do we diagnose them you know which virus it is and all that stuff so epstein barr virus cytomegalovirus they will cause infectious mononucleosis like symptoms and along with those infectious mononucleosis like symptom you will have the bilateral lymphadenopathy while if uh, you have adenovirus the adenovirus will cause pharyngoconjunctivitis you know pharyngoconjunctivitis fever and then there will be bilateral lymphadenopathy so these are the major points that uh, you should know about lymphadenopathy so till now we have covered otitis media we have covered rheumatic fever we have covered lymphadenopathy and how do you approach the case of lymphadenopathy so now let's talk about bronchiolitis and bronchiolitis is also a very important question that is uh, asked in the step 2 ck bronchiolitis age less than 2 years you won't see bronchiolitis in children more than the age of 2 years uh, the causative organism is respiratory syncytial virus how would how would the child present you know obviously there will be respiratory distress and what are the signs of respiratory distress you know uh, you know nasal flaring is a sign of respiratory distress grunting is a sign of respiratory distress and uh, uh, if you see the retraction in intercostals then there it is a sign of respiratory distress and obviously if there is low saturation you know uh, you know that the child is in respiratory distress and if the child is less than 2 years you can suspect that okay it might be bronchiolitis now what are the objective findings like 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 what what do you see uh, and uh, you know and you say that it might be bronchiolitis so the buzzword is that there will be diffuse okay in both the lungs there will be diffuse wheezes okay there will be diffuse wheezes as well as there will be diffuse crackles so there will be diffuse wheezes and diffuse crackles and if you see the diffuse wheezes and diffuse crackles you say that it is a case of bronchiolitis and how do you treat the bronchiolitis there will be options like corticosteroid there will be options like nebulized epinephrine there will be options like antibiotics what do you give so you do nothing okay you do nothing you do nothing you just you know give the supportive treatment and this is the whole idea behind the treatment of bronchiolitis now what do i mean by supportive treatment that if the patient requires oxygen give him oxygen yeah, there is no role of corticosteroid there is no role of uh, uh, antibiotic and there is no role of you know uh, nebulized epinephrine and stuff like that so you treat it with uh, uh, supportive treatment now there is a very important thing which is called as pilavizumab uh, 
Palavizumab is a monoclonal antibody, antibody and uh, we give it for the prevention of respiratory uh, syncytial virus mediated bronchiolitis and in which patient or in which infants do we give. If they are premature like, like less than 29 week gestation we give uh, palavizumab and uh, there is there is also uh, a role of palavizumab in uh, patients who have some congenital cardiac abnormalities um, so but 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 for the exams you should remember this thing that uh, if the child is less than 29 week gestation you give uh, palavizumab for the prevention of bronchiolitis now another important thing about bronchiolitis is that they they ask they ask like what 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 complication can bronchiolitis cause okay so you have to just uh, you know tell them that okay bronchiolitis can cause apnea so this is the major complication of bronchiolitis and uh, uh, bronchiolitis can cause apnea bronchiolitis can cause respiratory failure and stuff like that okay now there is a thing called as pertussis okay you know pertussis pertussis is nothing but it is the whooping cough uh, and uh, pertussis is caused by bordetella pertussis and they say what they ask you what is the most common you know cause like why does this bug causes pertussis so the answer is the waning immunity so actually what happens is that after you know you get the shots of uh, against this bordetella pertussis um, you know uh, the a, a cellular pertussis uh, or the tdap vaccine you give against it with the time the immunity will decrease and as the immunity decreases the pertussis bordetella pertussis will get a chance to attack your uh, respiratory system and uh, there will be you know the pertussis again now what are the presentation or what are the phases so you know first of all you have this uh, phase which is called as uh, uh, um, which is called as cataral phase then there is phase which is called as proxismal phase and then there is phase which is called as convalescent phase the cataral phase uh, you know it lasts from one to two weeks and uh, there is you know mild coryza there there mild be you know mild cough malaise and stuff like that the proxismal phase is the actual phase which lasts from two to eight weeks and there are various symptoms in this phase like you know you get those bouts of cough and after those bouts of cough you may have something which is called as inspiratory whoop and uh, in some patient there may be post tussive which means after the cough there may be post tussive vomiting there may be post tussive syncope uh, even you know rib fractures can also ha happen so this cuff is very severe so this is the uh, uh, what is called as the uh, cataral stage this is the paroxysmal stage and then there is a convalescent stage convalescent stage is like after eight weeks in which you know the symptoms they slowly decrease and the person returns to the baseline now these are the stages these are the basic uh, you know uh, stuff about the bordetella pertussis now what are you asked in the exam so in the exam you will be simply asked what is the treatment like doc what will you do in case of pertussis obviously you will give a macrolide like azithromycin erythromycin clarithromycin but you know stick with azithro azithromycin not erythro or clarithro you know okay now what is the treatment so treatment is macrolide now what do you give you know as a post exposure prophylaxis so this is very very important very very important in the exam you know in the exam they uh, they ask you what is what is the post exposure prophylaxis now you know there can be a scenario that okay so this is the uh, kid who got the uh, pertussis this is his father who has got vaccination this is his mother who has got vaccination you will think oh my god why is why is there any need to give father a vaccine or mother a vaccine no irrespective of the vaccination state this point is very very important and I am you know writing it in this uh, bold uh, thing irrespective irrespective of the vaccination status you give macrolide okay you give azithromycin irrespective of the vaccination status if there is a house uh, hold contact you give you give the macrolide irrespective you give the macrolide irrespective of the vaccination status so Till now, we have covered the otitis media. What are the most common points that you can be asked about? Rheumatic fever, uh, respiratory syncytial virus, bronchiolitis, obviously lymphadenopathy, how you will approach the lymphadenopathy, what are the complications of bronchiolitis and, uh, you know, macrolide. So, these are the four or five concepts and in the next video, I will be covering more concepts of infectious diseases related to pediatrics and I hope that you will like this series and uh, uh, will continue making these series. Thank you so much.